Hey everybody, uh, it's week 10. Uh, we've got two things we're going to do today. First of all, uh, this is uh, the guest speaker I've been referring to, Captain Matt Patnode. And Matt is an alumni of a little bit more than a decade ago, works for Boston Towing as a docking pilot, and he's going to speak to that. He's also, he's also going to give you a little bit of his history, how he got to be here. And I think that'll resonate, and I think that'll be uh, interesting to hear. And he kind of gives you um, some big brother type stuff, you know, some uh, alumni hints about getting into the business that he's in. I think it's, it's a real good. He, he's a, a very, very fine uh, person and a very, very fine captain. I think um, I hold him in high regards. So we'll do that, and then I'm going to come back. We'll uh, talk about some two things. We're going to talk about uh, special rudders and special propellers, just sort of some high-end stuff. And uh, I don't think I'll be too long on that. So here we go. Matt, you got it. So hello, ship handling. Uh, my name is Matt Pat Nude. Captain Teal asked me to do a little video, uh, help him out with some of this remote learning you guys are doing, and um, get a little insight from an alum of a life in the real world. Um, I'm a docking pilot in Boston. So I was a tugboat captain of Boston Towing and then was able to progress, start training as a docking pilot, and now I'm working exclusively as a docking pilot. <laughs> so first, I guess I will tell you a little bit of the story and how I decided to go to Maine Maritime, went there, you know, got through it, and how I got to where I am. So I grew up in Beverly, Massachusetts, a little city between uh, Boston, Gloucester, kind of near Salem, that area. I grew up hanging around the waterfront, you know, a bunch of lobster boats. It was a lot busier then than it is now. A couple of lobster, you know, a ton of lobster boats, a couple of gill netters, a couple of party boats, that kind of thing. And never really worked on it, never did any commercial fishing, but was always down there. Had a couple of friends whose fathers had lobster boats, so we were always, I guess, war frats, for lack of a better term. But So I had a little affinity for for working on the water from that point on. Um, grew up playing with skiffs and canoes, you name it. If it floated, I was into it. Um, then he kind of got into high school, wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. I had a you know, huge fascination with technology at the time. That was kind of when the internet had really started to come into its own. So I kind of really, you know, with the dot-com bubble and all the money that was being made in the world, I was really interested in pursuing technology for a career, but um, that, then politics to a certain degree, but ultimately decided that um, going to, you know, like Maine Maritime was gonna be a good choice. I had a friend whose older brother went there and I was uh, intrigued by the lifestyle he lived, that, you know, he could drive a, you know, beat up old Subaru and, you know, kind of lived like a hobo for lack of a better term, but, you know, was going to this really good school and was going to have a great career and then once he graduated you know he got to kind of see this the fruits of his success um and i think actually now he's a pilot out on the west coast in seattle so he obviously um got a pretty good return on his investment um excuse me for that um so that's kind of what what steered me in that direction um you know, then the research went back and forth. Is it the right school? What about Mass Maritime? In the, you know, it was, it was called SVO at the time, but, you know, now it's VOT, obviously. Um, that program, I think, partially for the, the fact that it wasn't a reg regimental program, because I don't know how well that would have worked for myself, at least at that point in time. I think I could have got through it and, and done fine if I needed to, but it wasn't really appealing to me at the moment. And obviously, for that reason, Mass Maritime was completely out of the question. So I actually don't think I even applied to any other schools other than Maine Maritime. Because I was, you know, was able to apply early enough, got accepted and had a pretty good idea that that was going to be the right place to go. So that's where I ended up. And, uh, you know, from that point, I was in a big rush to get out of there and graduate. Um, 
part part of, I guess I'll go back a little bit. Part of what attracted me to that the the SVO VOT program was it was like in that two plus two format. So, you know, at the time I didn't know how well college was going to work for myself. You know, for, for some other reasons, and the fact that I could get an associate's degree in two years and at least have some type of education, and then be on my way was was appealing as well. But you know, I was in a big rush to graduate. I took extra courses to, to you know kind of keep the credit um, credit total up, and I was able to graduate a semester early. But in retrospect, I don't really think that was the best the best thing to do. I could have taken a few more um, electives and. You know, it would have been good to have the, the PIC, maybe the med PIC, and a few other things. Not things that I really needed for my career, but just would have liked to have had. Um, so, you know, I guess you can keep that in the back of your mind. You're not going to miss anything by graduating a little early um, in, the, in the workforce. So, if you can take a few extra classes financially and stay there, then I would do that. So, wow, that's like five minutes exactly. So, um, I wanted to work on tugboats pretty much the whole time I was there. Towards the end of it, the supply boat world was really taken off. So, we're t you know, obviously, I didn't tell you, but I graduated in December 2007. So, that would put me, I guess, at class 2008. Um, but at the time, the, you know, the Gulf of Mexico was going, going wild. The money that was being paid was really attractive. And I had a, you know, really thought that was a, a really good good avenue to go for work, but it never really panned out. It was, I was always ready to do it. I had applications in, I had, I guess, tentative job offers, but it just, I, I wasn't able to do it. Um, and I'm, I guess I'm glad I did it. But um, once I graduated, I started working on tugboats, had a mate's job fairly quickly and, uh, you know, pretty much did ship docking exclusively. Always have moved barges, but I you know, never worked on an ATB or a, um, a, a wire boat for any length of time. So I guess I'm a ship docking guy through and through. Um, I did do some other work when things kind of crashed at one point or another. Um, everyone's gonna get laid off in this business at one point or other in your career. So don't get upset about it. It happens to everyone and just deal with it. But I, you know, you get laid off from the tugboat world and, I was able to find find work doing some other stuff closer to home, um, running a small supply boat for offshore LNG terminal. And that was some great experience, met some great people. And it bought me time to really find um, the right opening. And um, yeah, so it worked out. But um, I guess talking about my current situation and becoming a pilot and, and all that is that, um, I did my first co-op, I was 18 years old with, with Boston Towing in Boston, and then stayed in touch with them over the years. Throughout the time I was at school, I kind of had that open dialogue where I could yeah, call ahead and come in, go on the tugboat ride for the day, see what was going on, drive the boat a little bit. You know, got to stay, kind of stay fresh in everyone's memory. And uh, the same thing after I got out of school, I always said, listen, if you need a guy for a day or for a week, a month, whatever, call me, I want to work here. And uh, that, you know, just being persistent like that without annoying people, it will pay off as far as I'm concerned. And, you know, sure enough, eventually a full-time job opened up and, and I've been here ever since. I think that's like 11 years now. So it's been a little while. Um, but yeah, so what a docking pilot is, is um, I'm, I'm sure you guys have talked about this in your class, but we're all tugboat captains and we, um, you know, we go out and we get our, you know, first class pilotage endorsement on our license for, for the port that we're going to work in. And um, you train, you know, with, with the other pilots, you know, you spend a lot of time observing them, watching them dock ships, undock ships, um, do their other federal pilotage. And then, you know, eventually they'll say, all right, here you go. Put, tug, put your tugs where you want them and uh, do the job. I'm going to watch and criticize everything you do. So, um, you, know, you uh, follow that progression. And eventually, if you're lucky, you'll uh, get cut loose and they'll start assigning you to, to go do a job or two on your own. But um, I think I kind of missed the mark a little bit on, on an explanation. 
So we are, um, what a docking pilot does is we board the ship, what, you know, but from the tugboat or from shore, depends on, you know, inbound, outbound, and we'll, um, you know, put the tugs where they need to be to get to, to do the job. Um, and uh, we, you know, obviously take the con of the ship to give the tugboats commands to dock or undock the ship and either, you know, pilot it from away from the berth down the harbor a little ways until the state pilot takes over or, you know, on an inbound job, we'll board the ship, usually take the con for 10, 15 minutes, steer it towards the berth and then continue the maneuver from there. So it is a very fun job. It's almost all all action all the time. We're not like staring down the Houston Ship Channel for six hours at a time or the Mississippi River. We're just, you know, get on and go to work. One of the old pilots always said, you better get in character now on the deck of the tugboat before you get on that pilot ladder because, you know, you're going to walk in the bridge of the ship and you're going to go to work. You're, you're going to be ready to go. So that is what we do. And there's a lot of, you know, in addition to the actual ship handling, there's a lot of behind the scenes work. You know, we give tide windows for either under keel clearance or for, you know, we have a few maneuvers that we do that we like to have a certain stage of tide, um, depending on how big the range of tide is and the draft of the ship and, and whatnot. So we're, um, you know, we, we do a lot of coordinating behind the scenes. We have someone usually designated to do that, answer the phone, answer emails, be the spokesperson for the group. And then also they, We'll kind of assign the work amongst ourselves and uh, answer any questions that the customers have. And in, in addition to that, they'll, you know, they, we, however it is, will we'll suggest how many tugboats are needed for the, you know, particular maneuver. We have kind of standards for it, but if it's going to be really windy or a big tide or, you know, some other factors, they might say, yeah, instead of two boats, I want three. Or instead of a three boat job, it's going to be a four boat job. And but ultimately the pilot who's assigned that job is responsible for making sure they have a enough tugboats and enough horsepower to get the job done. And if for some reason you can't, then, you know, you have to put your foot down and say, maybe, maybe we can't do it. And that is a, you know, big part of the job that we have to um, deal with. So, you know, you get a lot of pressure, but you have to have to know how to handle that and, stand your ground and, and um, maintain your standards. Um, so obviously, it, when we take the con of a ship, we're, you know, we're going to hand on the radio, we're talking to our tugboats, we're giving the helmsman commands, and we're, um, you know, working the radio 13, doing, doing whatever you need to do to pilot a ship. But then we also have to, um, you know, you make arrangements with the captain for the mooring, um, arrangement, how many headlines, how many stern lines, you know, you always need to have looked at the weather and say, all right, yeah, this is an 1100 foot container ship. It's going to be blown 45 knots off the dock. I think you should probably put out a couple extra lines because that ultimately, you know, I'm not going to go to jail for uh, improperly mooring a ship, but I'm going to get a call into a hearing and I have to explain why I didn't recommend that they do so. And that's happened, you know, recently enough just in the port of Boston. So, it's a real part of the job. It's, you know, that's, it's something that falls on the pilot's shoulders. Also, once you get off the ship, is the ship going to go aground at low water? You know, would you put, which falls under the, you know, do you, did you put a ship in an unsafe berth? So that's another thing that warrants getting on the phone. You're going to talk to the agent, you're going to talk to the captain, the chief mate, and tell them you're only going to have six inches of under keel clearance. As far as the chart's concerned, what are we going to do about it? Are you, uh, are going to have pumped enough cargo in time to get the ship up? Or are we going to have to set a deadline for you to sail? It usually works itself out, but that's one of the things that we have to deal with. Um, and then, you know, so we're given commands and, and all that, like I just said, but you have to manage the personalities in the, um, bridge resource management, for lack of a better term, or in some ships you get on, the captain's really going to um, insist on being in charge. And, you know, you'll say hard to starboard. 
the helmsman's not going to acknowledge it until the captain repeats the command. And there's other ships where the captain's nowhere to be found. He's on his phone, he's doing paperwork. He might run down below for a few minutes. And, um, you know, they, they'll be really hands off. But, um, the, you know, the average is in the middle where they're they're involved, but they're not overbearing. Um, but they're going to um, give give hints a lot of the time without, without saying so much. Um, so, you know, once again, it comes down to personalities where you have to manage a lot of these things and and deal with them accordingly to safely and efficiently do the job. Like an example of that would be that they'll tell you, um, oh, the ship's very heavy, very heavy ship. At, at this draft, it's a very heavy ship. And obviously, you know, it's a deeper draft, but that's maybe a hint that he's going a little too fast for your comfort, uh, for his comfort. And for you, you might be perfectly happy, all right? I'm cutting, you know, it's two knots, I'm gliding in um, to the dock, we're closing, we're nice and flat, everything looks good. But if he keeps telling you oh, it's very heavy, or <clears throat> a good one I remember was uh, the very lazy stopping ship, the very lazy, very lazy. And uh, that was a sign that, all right, I'm just gonna go dead slow astern and see what happens here. Worst case scenario, slow down too much and you gotta give it another kick ahead. But I, I think listening to those hints that a captain will give you as a pilot are very, very helpful and can do the job safer and more efficiently if you actually listen and pick up on the things that they're saying. So, um, a lot of the times you give like like bow thruster commands, you'll say bow thruster half to port, full to port, etc. And if they're if they're good with the commands, they're good. Some of them will just give you the, the, the thruster controller and say, uh, bow thruster for you to use. And it's like, okay, good. And then suddenly they'll start reaching for it again. And, uh, you know, you, you think you get the perfect landing and approach. And the next thing you know, the, the bow or the stern's diving towards the dock. And then you look down at there, they get the thruster going full the wrong way without saying anything to you. But part of the reason, I guess, it's a little side thing is a lot of them don't like to give you the thruster controllers because there's pilots in other ports in the world that are not very good. And will go like full one way, full the other with, without like stopping in the middle. You know, it's stop and letting things settle down. And then next thing you know, generator will trip in the middle of maneuver. That's not a situation you really want to be in. Um, I guess, like, as far as the technical ship handling stuff goes, uh, rate of turn is like second to speed. Obviously, you know, you want to go slow. And I got a few videos that maybe you'll get to look at at some point of uh, my plotter, but um, rate of turn. You gotta have, you know, you don't wanna be approaching a, uh, say you're gonna make a huge turn, you know, there's a few, few, few for example, in Boston that they have to make. And if you're like swinging to port, when ultimately the turn you need to make is to starboard, you know, you've got all that inertia of that turn. And it only means like one or two degrees a minute. And that's gonna like seem like you're, you know, you're hard over and, it's, it's way out of control. So where we like to be is to have like, you know, half a knot, one knot of rate of turn in the right direction well before it's even time to um, to make that turn. So what you could do there is like you, sometimes you'll, I think you probably have heard this term. The first time I heard it was in chip handling is cycle the rudder. And that in the practical application is you'll over swing Say, say we're gonna make a hard, really hard turn to port or to starboard, as we'll overswing a little bit to port and be, you know, to port of our, um, you know, our track line or our, our mark, knowing that we're gonna then start a little bit of turn to starboard like way, way ahead of time. And that'll kind of get us back on where we're supposed to be or supposed to be where we're looking at with, we're just creeping, we're just creeping, we're just creeping. That way, when we're ready to give it to it, we've already got a little bit of momentum going the right way. Um, so I don't know if that makes sense or not, but you know, the last thing you want to be doing is having any rate of turn in the wrong direction before you need to actually do something because you're going to waste, you know, you're going to have to go hard over, you're going to have to give it another bell or actually start using the boats just to make a turn. And that's not the, the way you want to be a pilot. You want to be able to get things going on their own, you know, nine out of 10 times without having any external factors needed to do it. And the same thing goes, once you get that rate of turn going, you get it going and you can always slow it down or increase it, but it's just very hard to initiate 
um, a real hard swing, especially in a, in real tight quarters where you can't be, you know, you can't co uh, correct for, you know, starting your turn late and sliding 300 feet across the, your intended track because then you're you're kind of out of options. You're gonna have to use your boats, and depending on what boat you have, you might not be able to do it a lot. So I've seen it. I haven't really lived it too much myself, but you know, you don't wanna you don't wanna be there. Um, you know, and that's obviously with the you know deep draft ship on a lighter lighter draft ship. You know, where you're only maybe drawing 15, 17 feet. It's a whole other animal where you can slide. And um, I think I kind of liken it to like a, you know, a shopping cart, taking a shopping cart down a uh, icy hill, like take it down to the waterfront from, from your classroom up there at the top of the hill on an icy snowy day. And that's what it feels like driving a, uh, you know, 15, 16 foot dra draft scrap ship or something like that that's got no cargo in it and limited horsepower. That is, I don't know, it's hard to explain, but it's its fun. Um, we're starting to see the bigger container ships. You know, they got bigger, 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 and then they've stayed the same. So right now we're really just dealing with like a 10,000 TEU ship, which is just over 100,000 deadweight tons. Uh, usually we're doing that job for stopping, backing in. I could up, probably send a video along. Uh, what that maneuver looks like but we're backing them in to the terminal and um, it's a really fun job to do those ships believe it or not handle really well you get like a hundred thousand horsepower main engine it, you know probably four thousand horsepower bow thruster and um, which is on the very tip of the bow so you get a ton of leverage and um, they're very effective and they're deep in the water they work good but their deceiving thing is they're so heavy you know, like I had one, I got kind of comfortable doing them at like 34, 35 feet, which is a pretty light draft for a ship that size, but it's still a 34, 35 foot draft ship. And then you, they throw one at you that's 38 and it doesn't want to stop. You know, it's only a couple feet deeper, but that's a couple feet deeper over 11, you know, 1100 feet by 150 feet. That makes a huge difference in um, the handling. You know, they'll still turn and back and, and do everything you want, but they don't stop. And that same thing goes for going going sideways into the dock. They're just gonna keep going. They'll go right through the dock, I guess, if you let them. Um, so that's kind of the fun fun, uh, fun side of ship handling. It's a great job. Um, I guess the final things I'll say about this career path um, is that you need to network. You need to be personable enough that you can get along with people and not make it seem like you're um, kissing up to them either. You know, just be, you, you gotta be social. You have to get along with them and you can't you can't walk into a, an, an opportunity or a job in a port where you think there might be a pilot job by um, just, uh, oh yeah, I'm gonna be a pilot. That's what I wanna do. You know, you gotta come in, head down, be a tugboat captain or be, you know, whatever, whatever it is, you know, not every place is a docking pilot. Um, but you know, whether it be a state pilot, sea pilot, bar pilot, whatever, um, you, you know, you can't walk in with that, that attitude that that's what you're going to do. You know, you have to, um, yeah, it's a good option. I, you know, I'm, I'd be interested in it, but you know, right now I just want to be a tugboat captain. And then you, you know, you slowly make those connections, build your network, do, do a good job, keep your mouth shut, don't start trouble, um, get, get your piloted strips when you can. And, uh, the, the rest usually will take care of itself and you know that's how it worked for myself and i've seen it happen for for other people as well so um yeah and in personality you you know you should try to live a pretty good lifestyle not have a you know i, I don't like to single anyone i'm making one feel bad because you can overcome these things but you know you should try to have a pretty good criminal record and not you know have license suspensions and things like that because that's the kind of thing that's going to turn off um people from accepting you into their group they like people that are very stable you know haven't been divorced three times don't have you know they don't want to they don't want people coming into their pilot group with, that have problems at home and in their relationships they want stable people um so you're young enough now in, in most cases that you can 
kind of right the ship and um, steer steer straight and avoid some of those problems later on in life if that's if that's a career you want to have. You know, I obviously, like most of you, did, did some pretty stupid things and unfortunately never had to really suffer the consequences of them. So I consider myself lucky, but if I can advise you now, I'm, I'm here to do so. So I guess I won't continue to ramble on, but um, that's my story and hopefully you found it interesting. Well, hey, um, thank you uh, to Captain Padno for that uh, joining us. Uh, telling us uh, telling us some stuff about docking masters and sharing his thoughts and just everything that he does. And so I have a tremendous amount of respect for him, as I as I mentioned. And um, I'm sure if you want to reach out to him, I can put you in touch. Um, and I'm sure he would uh, very much enjoy talking to you as well. But let's keep going. And I want to finish up this. We're going into just highlighting what's in Chapter 9 on special propellers and rudders. I'm going to be thinking a little, a little bit more about them than just they're doing something that helps the ship turn. So let's go down here. This is kind of an interesting deal. I selected this picture because uh, you don't usually see stern thrusters. These stern thrusters are, they appear to be uh, in the skeg, the skeg being between you know, like an extension of the keel. But this is clearly a twin screw propeller. This is the starboard prop. Um, there's, we can't see it. Uh, we, we do see uh, the rudder behind the prop. It is a controllable pitch and it's a uh, feathered right now. It wouldn't be generating any thrust. It's just so interesting to see two of these. I have no idea what this ship is. I wish I did, but I, I just couldn't find any data on it. All right. So it was good stuff just to look at. Um, I also want to just be thinking about, uh, propellers again. We, we talked a little bit about, you know, uh, trailing edge, leading edge. I think we did that. Um, so this is a matched pair. This would be a, a matched pair on a, it looks like there would be a pretty small boat, a small vessel. Uh, this is a right-hand turning uh, propeller. This is a left-hand turning propeller. This would, looks to me like it would be the pair for a twin screw. Um, remember the terms that I used in class, uh, inboard or outboard turning, inboard turning over the top, or outboard turning over the top. Let's see, these would be, well, think about this. These would be what? These would be, there you go. This would be outboard turning over the top. This is a right-hand screw. This is a left-hand screw, but outboard turning over the top. This one's turning this way and so on and so forth. This one's turning this way, outboard turning over the top. Yeah, you know, it's just, I wanted you to think about that and bring you back and think a little bit more about propellers. There's this, 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 this huge array of propellers. What I want to focus on is the word skew. Propellers, um, propellers that look like, like this one here in the middle are said to be a skewed propeller. They're clearly different than this one over here. This one is pretty much, each blade is kind of symmetrical from the, from the leading edge to the trailing edge. The leading edge of propeller is the one that cuts through first. So this is a right-hand turning propeller. This is the leading edge. This is the leading edge. This is the leading edge. On a skewed propeller, this is a right-hand turning propeller. This is the leading edge. This is the following edge or trailing edge. It was clearly different. And we can see all these different types. Some have a curve to the trailing edge. Some have they're, they're, they're almost squared up on the trailing edge. This is the leading edge here on this particular one. They do have different applications. If we were looking for a zero skew, zero skew propeller, it would probably be something like this, which I would suspect is either, either in a bow thruster or it's in a, uh, what would you guess, probably a, a court nozzle because we've seen stuff like that. It has very, very little skew. Go on to the next one. Uh, so, you know, we're, again, we've already really talked about this, but uh, a blade that has uh, is symmetrical is said to have, or uh, radially symmetrical is said to have zero screw uh, skew. Any sweep or swept back attitude to that 
uh, propeller is said to be a very high skew. This is an incredibly aggressive skewed propeller, so much so that depending on the angle that you look at it, it almost appears that you you don't have any, um, you know, you can't see through here, but I think that's more just the angle. I think this is really a similar propeller, highly skewed. Look at the sort of the, you know, the blank space between the leading and trailing edge, where here, you know, significantly different. A skewed blade helps reduce vibration and therefore improves overall efficiency. But I want to tell you something else, which which it really isn't written here. You know, a skewed propeller, when it's when it's designed, it's put aboard a ship, it does really good, really well at going ahead. I mean, it 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 just is aggressive in one direction, but it really sucks going astern. You just don't get the same amount of thrust. Where something like these two little ones up here, they're pretty much 50-50. They do great going ahead, and they're, they're, they do almost as great going astern. They're symmetrical. Makes sense. This one, not so much. It does good going ahead. It does really good going ahead, but not so much going astern. It's all because of that angle of the uh, the, of the leading and the trailing edge. So food for thought, think about that. The next topic that I want to show you is, um, you know, it gets into some new technology. This this particular one, and I got to change the image here. And I, I, I just wanted to resize that. This is the Wartzilla, I think that's pronounced, Energo, Ener <laughs> Energo Flow, um, and it, it, it has different names. It's uh, it's fins that are located forward of the rudder, forward of the propeller, obviously forward of the rudder too, but we're talking about being forward of the propeller to change the flow of water as it comes in. You know why they do this? They, uh, naval architects are looking to squeeze the last ship owners. Everybody's looking to squeeze the last little bit of energy out of that propeller. This particular one here, just check this out. This particular device, cost-effective, pre-swirl stator that increases fuel efficiency by up to 10% without increasing any maintenance cost. In other words, there's no moving parts. That's huge. I mean, they are a winner in the market. This is a, another pre-swirl stator. I, I can't explain that too much. It has a different appearance. I mean, everybody is fighting to get that done. Just a different view, a different manufacturer. I don't know what the technology, which it would have gains there. Uh, Wartzella was, uh, was uh, saying that theirs is uh, uh, better. I've often seen numbers like three, four, and maybe even 5% on some of this. Here's something, I, I believe it's pronounced a MUIS, M-E-U-I-S, I believe, a MUIS duct. It's very similar, um, but again, it's all about trying to improve the efficiency of the vessel. This is, there's no moving parts. And if we go to this one, uh, this is a propeller rotating, a counter rotating boss cap. So this, this little boss cap here, actually it's not counter rotating. It, um, it's going to follow, it's going to try to capture a little bit of that post uh, thrust that's coming off. This is a highly skewed propeller, right? Um, we just talked about that. It's just trying to capture a little bit more energy. I think this would be at the 1% type stuff as opposed to the earlier one, which I talked about is, um, or they claim to be, you know, upwards of 10%. So there's some interesting stuff. You know, I, why do I tell you all this or why, you know, why am I looking at this? You know, you join a ship and you're the, you're the uh, officer, you're the, you're the new mate, or you are, um, you're involved with, um, with a ship assist and you're working on tugboats and, um, you know, you are Matt Patno and maybe you're the docking pilot. You, you need to be familiar with all these different technologies because, the captain's going to say to you, oh, pilot, um, you know, we've got a MUIS duct down here, or we've got a pre-swirl stator 
and that changes the way the ship backs. I don't know that that changes it, but, you know, somebody might say something along those lines. We have to be professionally engaged when we, when we, uh, when we're talking about this stuff. This is, um, this is, comes out of the, comes out of the reading, and I wanted to highlight uh, things to consider when maneuvering, and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to maneuver. We're maneuvering with a controllable pitch propeller. Well, first of all, not sure if you know all, if you know this term. The ship uses a combinator. Some of you may have learned this term back in uh, engineering fundamentals, but not everybody. <clears throat> a large ship will use something called a combinator, which blends RPM and pitch control into one unit, one uh, sort of throttle-looking device in the wheelhouse, which um, brings them together, usually computer-controlled. Um, the combinator, very common. Whenever you have a controllable pitch propeller, yeah, you can separate those out. You can control RPM and you control pitch separately, but generally, if not always, it's always going to be brought together in a combinator. So the device that you move forward or back up on the, the bridge of a ship that has a controllable pitch propeller, even a workboat, you're probably not, not only adjusting the pitch, you're also adjusting the RPM. There's another comment which is uh, summarized here. Be aware of the spinning solid, solid plate effect when, um, when you have zero thrust or when, the, when it's stopped. Now, that doesn't mean it's not spinning. It's still spinning. The shaft is spinning, but you have zero pitch. So it's acting like a solid disc operating in that water. We very often refer to it as the propeller disc. It's like a blur. If you try to look at it, it's just a blur down there. Uh, visually, I mean, we don't really care about the visual aspect, but um, the thing about that is that when you are stopped engines, the shaft's still turning, and you get a tremendous amount of turbulence behind that spinning disc, so much so that it affects the rudder and the ability to turn. You have a lot of turbulence, it's usually chewed up the water, and you don't get the turning effect out of the rudder when you go to zero pitch. You actually get more turning ef effect if you just you, you bring the pitch down to uh, a very, very reduced number, but not all the way to zero. Next thing says transverse thrust from a controllable pitch. Uh, we we discussed, discussed it earlier in the course, but the author adds here that it's usually very weak and unreliable. Uh, okay, I'm not sure about unreliable, but certainly weak. As you go to zero pitch, you might still be turning that RPM, but you're not getting any thrust forward or ahead, and and therefore you're not getting any significant transverse thrust either, which makes sense when I say it like that. Last thing is propeller creep, or next to last thing. Even though the indicator up on the bridge reads zero pitch, the vessel may still have a very slow movement, either ahead or stern. This could be kind of a serious consequence if you were close proximity to the berth and you were just fine-tuning the, the first or last maneuvers around the uh, ship. You know, a zero-pitch and something else, a zero-pitch propeller spinning at revolution underwater is pretty good at sucking in mooring lines. You don't have to always be having thrust to suck in mooring lines. I, I have many, many times where I've pulled, uh, you know, on small boat applications, I've pulled a line into propellers. I've never been on a ship that we have ever done that, but I've heard stories of mooring lines being sucked onto the propeller and just wound up. You think about a, a 9 or a 12-inch circumference mooring line being... Um, sucked in and wrapped up around a, uh, a large ship's propeller and how that is a, uh, that's kind of a game stopper, at least until you get a crew down there, divers down, so to speak. One more thing, it's just one more thing to break down, right? You, It's a mechanical instrument, it's underwater, you know, certainly a fixed pitch old school propeller is probably, it's not going to fail unless you hit something and knock one of the blades off, but 
you know, uh, controllable pitch, CP, variable pitch propeller, another word for it, you know, you're likely to have problems with that. Next topic. This is a flap rudder. There's also a uh, manufacturer's name. It's a, it's a brand name. It's called a Becker, B-E-C-K-E-R, a Becker rudder. But like many things, the, the, the uh, there's other manufacturers who make this flapped. So here's, this is a unique vessel here. So we've got a, a nozzled propeller. All right. It looks like we've got a stern thruster in the skeg. And then we have a flat propeller up here. What's unique about this is that you can get tremendous, almost lateral thrust. Because you get that extra little angle at the trailing edge of the rudder. Here's another one. So here's the propeller, obviously. Here's the front edge of the rudder. Here's the flap on the back. This is the aft end. Let's go back and think about just a traditional rudder. Traditional rudders, you know, 35, 45 maximum degrees. And, and they work. And, and you know, a rudder is like a hydrofoil on, a, on a, a vertical plane, but still develops lift either to port or starboard. So here we've got some port rudder. And if we go any more than that, we go to this diagram here, we just stall out just like an airplane airplane wing would stall and not have any lift. If you go too much with a rudder, you go up over 45 degrees, the rudder is just going to be, um, you could say it has a braking effect, but it doesn't have any steering effect. It is absolutely not meant to do this. But however, if you have a Becker or a flap rudder, it's intentional. And so that's pretty cool. That's pretty good technology. And, um, You'll come across that. There's ships coming up here in Penobscot Bay, and I've talked to the pilots over the years, and uh, they, you know, they they enjoy, they like that extra extra ability. Uh, the pilots here in Penobscot Bay will, will tell you that it, it, uh, at slow speeds, you know, these actually act as a stern thruster. You can get nearly uh, 90 degree thrust to the center line of the vessel. It's interesting to note that with this style, you only can do that. That 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 flap only sort of engages. It only moves when you're at uh, maneuvering and slower speeds. You can't, in other words, you can't be at sea speed of a ship doing 15 or 20 knots and go 70 degrees uh, right rudder or left rudder. It, it would tear the rudder apart. So as the vessel goes faster, the ability to do this is factored out. All right. Small little thing, but here we have an optional rotor. Um, if we want to talk about that, you can catch me in class. But that was mentioned. Uh, the same thing was mentioned on the skeg of the um, VSP. Uh, Voss Schneider uh, drive ships also had a, on the trailing edge, on the trailing edge of the skeg on a VSP ship, there was a, it's not mechanized, it's just free spinning, but that's what that is. If you're interested, we can talk about that more. There's another type of rudder, it's called a shilling rudder. And um, let's see, shilling profile is designed to improve uh, effective lift generated by the rudder and hence improve maneuverability of the craft. This is a small vessel, this is a shilling rudder. Here's the top down view. Kind of looks like the top-down view of a fish. Tail, head, body. Kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Here's a, a better diagram of it and uh, a little bit more of a schematic. And you can see that this can be uh, changed over to 70 degrees. And again, there's that almost uh, lateral thrust at 90 degrees to the center line of the vessel. So it's a shaped rudder. There's no moving parts on this one, which makes it better. Here's a little bit of a comparison about um, the, with a shilling rudder. So a conventional rudder, uh, let's see, these are ship lengths, four ship lengths, and five ship lengths. Conventional rudder has, you know, three and a half, four ship lengths to make a turn, which we, I think we talked about that early in the class. Uh, three or three and a half, four, three to four ship lengths to, to do a turn with a conventional rudder. 
with a Schilling rudder, even at limiting to 35 degrees, it has just, you know, two and a half as a, as a uh, diameter of a turning circle, the blue line here. That's, that's significant, the difference between the, the blue and the green. But a Schilling rudder at slower speeds, we get down to almost one ship length, getting close to it. That, that's a pretty significant little thing for, for this rudder to do. You couldn't do that at high speeds. This is to get that, to get that effect of this red turning circle. We're talking about, you know, maneuvering speeds, tight end maneuvering, pushing it ahead, positioning the rudder, giving it that pop ahead, that type of stuff. Then you get that thrust. Almost using the rudder more as a thruster than as a steering, the way we traditionally think of it. So there's a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, we talked about non-traditional or different types of rudders. I wanted to go over that. That took about 20 minutes or so. And uh, so there you go. There's the, uh, there's the week 10 lecture. Have a good weekend. And we'll see you on Monday. Bye-bye.